Welcome along to our big 2021 GCN Tour de France preview show, which this year is brought to you by official race timing partners, Tissot. Yeah, who have kindly sent one of their lovely new Tour de France edition watches to, to Dan. They have, and it looks fantastic. And I'm sure yours will arrive in good time. Yeah, but I'm now talking of time, over the next half an hour or so, we are gonna tell you everything you need to know about what promises to be the most thrilling Tour de France in a long time. Yeah, this year's edition really is a mouth-watering prospect. From the much-anticipated GC battle to the quest for sprint supremacy over a route that promises suspense, drama and huge battles every single day. Yeah, coming up we will be talking through the route, giving you some dates to black out in your diaries, looking at the key riders and teams and making some outlandish predictions. You can speak for yourself, Si. I'm playing it safe with my predictions this year. Right, so we will start by taking a look at what the riders are going to be tackling. Usual format, 21 stages over three weeks and a total of 3,383 kilometres, all starting this Saturday, the 26th of June. Yep, the stages are divided up as follows. Eight flat stages, although the first of those comes later than normal, more on that later on. And then we've got five hilly days, six stages in the high mountains, two time trials, and then two rest days on the second and third Mondays of the race. Yeah, before we get on to the finer details, we will of course be bringing you live coverage of every single kilometre of every stage on GCM Plus, as well as the breakaway, which is our daily pre and post race analysis shows, with a variety of well known faces on there. But there are territory restrictions. There are. Uh, so the live coverage along with the pre and post race breakaway shows will be available throughout Europe and also in the Asia Pacific except for China, Japan, New Zealand and Australia. However, all the news, maps, profiles, stage previews, results, stats, the World of Cycling weekly show and the short highlights are available in all GCM Plus territories. So there is going to be a lot there for you to look at even if you can't watch it live on our platform. Now, the race was due to start in Copenhagen this year, but race organizer ASO were forced to move the race forward by a week due to the revised Olympics this year. So Copenhagen requested to move their grand apart back to 2022, and so Brittany have stepped forward. They did. Uh, so the riders will encounter the first stages in northwestern France, and it's not what they would usually expect to encounter. This year, we'll not start with a prologue or a time trial or a sprint stage, but rather with a stage for the punchers, those that are suited to short, sharp climbs. Yep, last time that happened, 10 years ago. Philippe Gilbert took the stage and therefore the yellow jersey. And you'd imagine it'd be a similar type of rider this time around. The opening stage itself is 198 kilometers from Brest to Lander now. So a long stage and one with six categorized climbs. Yes, despite the severity of the stage though, we are expecting most of the bunch to arrive at the foot of that final climb together, which in turn should mean that Alaphilippe, Van der Poel, Van Aert, Sagan, Pugaccia, Roglic, Valverde, Woods, Matthews, Colbrelli, Ineos, Grenadiers, 20 team leaders and everybody else will be doing battle on that final slope to the finish line. Wow. And so I reckon this should be the first date for your diary, Saturday the 26th of June. You never want to miss the start, but even more so this year because La Corse will also take place on that same finale on that same day. The final climb, which is the Côte de la Fosse au Loup, has never been used before at the race. No doubt many teams are going to be taking a close look at it in advance and they will find a three kilometer climb that averages 5.7 percent. Yeah, albeit with the first two kilometers of that climb being the steepest and a section there that is in double digits. And the sprinters are going to have to be patient this year because stage two is another hilly affair. Another six categorized climbs, this time over 184 kilometers, that will finish on the climb more familiar to many of us. That is the Muir de Bretagne. Cadell Evans, Alexi Viermoz, and Dan Martin have all won on that climb on Tour de France stages on there over the last 10 years. It's two kilometers long at 6.9%. The favorites to win will almost be exactly the same as they were on day one. And then, Finally, the sprinters will get their chance on day three. It's 183 kilometers from Lorient to Pontivy. The only thing that could upset them is the chance of crosswinds 
Although, to be fair, they normally deal with them pretty well, don't they? Yeah, sprinters aren't bad at crosswind no. generally, are they? Uh, the fourth stage is the final one to take place in Brittany, and it's another one for the sprinters. And then it's time for the time trialers to have their fun. Stage five is the first of the two time trials in the race, and this one is 27 and a half kilometers from Changer to Laval, which makes it the longest first week individual time trial for the last 13 years. Well, I could fuck that. Now, gaps amongst the favorites might not be large, but will be given a real indication as to who's hot and who's not. And you can guarantee that a couple of the GC contenders will lose far more time here than they would like. Yeah, you'd have thought so. Uh, stage six is another sprint fest, finishing in Chateauroux, which is incidentally where Mark Cavendish took the first of his 30 Tour de France stage wins. Although it's yet another stage where the wind could play a factor in the outcome. And then stage seven takes the rise from the center of the country in Vierzon and heads to the east in Le Creuseux. Ah, it's the hardest road stage of the race to that point anyway, and the longest of the whole three weeks. A whopping 250 kilometers with almost all the climbing in the second half. And the final of those, the first second category climb of the race, is 5.7 kilometers long, 5.7% average, but with the top coming at around 20 k's to go, it's probably not gonna produce any significant changes on GC. Although, Stages eight and nine will do. Uh, so get Saturday the 3rd and Sunday the 4th of July in your diaries because we're heading to the first of the mountains that weekend. And it's the Alps. Uh, this stage on the Saturday, we've got five climbs en route to Le Grand Bonnant, the last three of which is first category. And the last of those is La Grande Colombière. The Col de Rome precedes it, and that's the same double punch that was used in the 2018 Tour, which was a stage won by Julien Alaphilippe. Yeah, I've given you all the French names, Si, because Thanks, you're mate. so yep. good at them. Uh, but yeah, the Col de Rome is a spectacular looking climb, and it's the harder of the two on that day. Nine Ks long at just under 9% average gradient, whilst the Colombier, seven and a half Ks at eight and a half percent. After that, though, it's 15 kilometers mainly on a descent to the finish. Uh, the following day, though, there is yet more climbing, and we've got the first first all category climb of this year's race. That's right, it's the Col du Pré, and it sits in the middle of the 145 kilometer stage from Clues to Tignes. Yeah. Which where is where they were due to finish that tour stage, weren't they, back in 2019, before it had to be shortened due to that freak storm and landslide, yeah, if you remember. Correct, and ASO have stayed true to their promise of going back there at the first opportunity. Anyway, as I was saying before, I was rudely interrupted. The Col du Pré is 12.6 kilometers long, 7.7%, and it effectively leads straight on to the Cormet de Rosaline, which peaks at just under 2,000 meters above sea level. Although by the end of the stage, they'll be well over 2,000 metres above sea level because that climb to Tigné is really bloody long. 21 kilometres to be precise, a 5.6% average gradient. That on its own would be like a two hour ride for me. Yeah, and days. you'd probably need a rest as well. Uh, anyway, it won't take the pros quite that long, obviously. And as it's a short stage overall, this one could prove really punchy, particularly as it comes the day before the first rest day. So expect fireworks and if none come, Blame us. Although we can't refund your time. No, we? that's true. Uh, no, come on, that is definitely going to be a stage full of fireworks. Oh, yeah. Short, punchy, lots of climb. I can feel it in my bones. Yeah, no, it will. No doubt. Now, after the rest day, stage 10 avoids all of the mountains in the Savoie region as they take on the 190 kilometer route from Albeville to Valence. Wind again could play a factor, but it should be a sprint. And then we're back into the high mountains the following day with the much anticipated double ascent of Mont Ventoux. Double ascent savage. I think that's how we best describe it, wouldn't it? Uh, the Ventoux, I suspect, needs no introduction, but it will be introduced twice on Wednesday, the 7th of July. So another date for your diaries, that one. Firstly, it takes on the easy, or should we say the easier side of the mountain from So. Although it's also the longest, actually, isn't it? So uh, kind of bittersweet. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. Especially when you then have to descend back down and take on the harder and more traditional side of the mountain from Bedouin. That one goes all the way to the top, past the Tom Simpson Memorial and to the tower at the summit. But they don't finish there, though, this time. They'll be descending almost 1,600 metres over 22 kilometres to the finish line in Malosen. What a cracker that is going to be. To watch not yes. to ride, especially if you're not a sprinter or not a climber, shall I say, in the race. Uh, they'll have the opportunity as a sprint, though, on the stage 12, which goes into Nîmes, although that area, again, notoriously windy, <laughs> Si. 
could happen anywhere echelons this year. So after that, it's another fairly flat day on stage 13, albeit long, 220 kilometers to Carcassonne. Two flat days in a row. You know what that means? Yep, plenty Climb. of climbing on the third weekend of the race. Stage 14 to Kian is a hilly transitional type stage, which looks good for a breakaway, doesn't it? It does, yeah. I used to do a post-tour criterium in Kian, and every time you went round, if you gave your bottle off to the people that were outside a bar, they would hand it back to you on the next lap full of beer. They wouldn't. They would. <laughs> Not even joking. Was it at least Cronenberg? I have absolutely no idea or recollection what was in it, but I can tell you it was quite a novelty at the time. Uh, anyway, I'm sure the riders won't be partaking in any of that in Kion, particularly as they've got a big day to follow because stage 15 will see them head over the border from France into Andorra via the Port d'En Villare, uh, which is this year's souvenir Henri de Grange as the highest point of this race, a whopping 2,408 metres above sea level. Wow, that is high, isn't it? Particularly for the Tour de France. It is, yeah. uh, two climbs uh, lead them uh, onto that one and then there'll be another one as after it before descent down to the finish in Andor la Vie. Which is where a lot of riders base themselves at the moment, isn't it? It's like a cycling's modern day Monaco without the glitz and glamour. As it's in Andorra, uh, in which the race and its entourage will then spend the second and final rest day. After that, they will head back into France, of course, on Tuesday the 13th of July. That's stage 16, which includes the Col de Pau, the Col de la Cour, and the Col de Porte d'Aspe. But it's Wednesday the 14th of July, which is the next one for your calendar. Oh yes, the highest mountaintop finish of this year's race. Stage 17 starts in Muret. It's flat in the first half, and then anything but in the second. The Col du Perrosord and the Col de Val Laurent Azé serve as a prelude to the final climb, which is the Col de Porte. Yeah, more names for you there, Si. Yep. <laughs> uh, some of you remember that Col de Porte, actually, as the host of that gimmick that ASO and the Tour de France had a couple of years back, 2018, I think, the Formula One type gridding system. Which oh, they had. Yeah. We'd all geared ourselves up for a fast and frantic start, and then nothing. Absolutely nothing. It wasn't a particularly successful experiment, oh, rubbish, that one, was it? it? Anyway, the Col de Porte itself is brutal. 16 k's long with an average gradient of just under 9%, and the finish line is 2,215 meters above sea level. If there are any climbers who need to claw back time or just gain it before the final time trial, this is probably the place to do it. Yeah, or not, because they could do it on the following day, summit finish as well. Stage 18 really, though, is their last chance because it's the final mountain stage. A very traditional looking stage at that. Two big climbs, the Col de Tourmalet first from the Saint-Marie de Calpin side, yeah. that side. And it's going to be the 88th time that the Col de Tourmalet has featured at the Tour de France wow. since it was first introduced 111 years ago. I had to double check that, although it's only been a summit finish in that time on three occasions. Uh, there won't be a fourth this year either because after that they'll descend down before heading up to Luzard de Den, a climb a lot of you will remember, I'm sure you do too, Si, because Lance Armstrong crashed at the bottom of that climb, didn't he, when his bars got caught up in a musette bag being held by a roadside spectator. I remember that He still very won, well. though. He did, didn't he? It was a bit like a red rag to a bull, that, wasn't it? Yeah, well, lots of things were to Armstrong. Well, it? that's true, yeah. <laughs> All it took was a musette. Uh, anyway, it is a stunning climb, that one. And tough, too, isn't it? 13.3 k's long at 7.4%. And that is the last major climb of the race. And that end, the end, sorry, of the shortest stage of the race, uh, if you discount the final one, it's Paris, of course. So explosive will be the word. We're hoping, again. Uh, date for the diary? Yes, I think so. Okay, put it in. Thursday the 15th of July is that one. Okay. Uh, stage 19 is one which would almost certainly finish in a bunch sprint if it was in the first week of the race, but coming near the end of the third week, how the winners decided into Libourne will depend really on how many sprints are left and indeed how much energy their teammates still have to chase things down. Yeah. Stage 20, like last year, is a time trial. The second of two this time around, and the longest of the two are just under 31 kilometers. So not an epic time trial by any stretch of the imagination. Now it's hard to imagine this one would be quite as dramatic as the scenes that we witnessed on La Planche de Belleville last year, partly because it's fairly flat, and partly because that sort of drama comes once in a generation. I mean, we're hoping for a lot of excitement, aren't we? But yeah. like you, it's hard to imagine it's going to get as good as it did on that penultimate stage last year. You never know your luck, though. And either way, we will see the overall win decided on that stage into saint Emilion, which is where the time trial finishes. Yeah, the final day will be back in Paris with the traditional laps of the Champs-Élysées likely to finish in a sprint. Now, do you remember the last time it didn't end in a sprint? Uh, Binokarov won, didn't he? 
believe so. I don't remember what the year was though. 2005. Ah. Yeah, I should have, I think I, anyway. I think I did know that. But that is the route. Uh, it's the riders that make the race though, of course. But just before we head on to getting onto the riders, we want to tell you all about the Tour de France hub that we're going to have on the GCN app this year. Yeah, we do. So we are making a specific place on the main bar at the top of the app for everything Tour de France related to sit during the three weeks. News, trivia, stats, quizzes, polls, and much more. We're also encouraging you to get involved as well and to post your personal tour memories into this feed. And to do that, you need to upload your photos with the hashtag TDF2021. So upload them in the usual way and then in the description Put hashtag TDF2021. Yeah, looking forward to seeing all of those. I might add a couple myself. Yeah, me too. Uh, anyway, we better get on to talking about the favourites for the race because there are a lot of them to talk about this yes, year. Yes, there are, which is why we are all so excited about it this year. Should we start with the strongest team or the strongest riders, Dan? Well, let's just start with last year's winner, Tali Pogaccia, shall we? Uh, he won the race on the eve of his 22nd birthday last year, which I still find unbelievable. Uh, he's really consistent, isn't he? Now, I read out a stat on the racing news show last week, which I'm going to repeat again here on the preview show. Ineos Grenadiers have never won a stage race overall in which Tali Pogaccia started. That is a good stat. I mean, hardly anyone has, have they? Because he's won, <laughs> what, half of the 14 stage races? He has, yeah. started. He's won yeah. seven out of 14. Crikey. Uh, and that's since turning pro in 2019. Uh, so seven stage race wins, uh, the latest of which was his home tour just over a week ago. And he's also had 10 podiums, 13 top 10s, and just one time outside of the top 10. That was at the Tour Down Under in 2019, which was his first race as a pro. And so, where did he finish in that one? Well, 13th. What a chopper. Yeah, exactly. Hey? Terrible. Anyway, what we're saying is that although he only finished third at his national TT champs behind Tratnik and Polanch, he will be up there at the Tour, won't he? Even we're quite safe in making that prediction, aren't we? What is more unknown, though, is his team. Isn't yes. It? UAE Team Emirates, because last year he had... Well, he had Jumbo Visma, didn't he, working for him, basically? <laughs> he did, yes. He had another team that were very strong yeah. working for his goals. Uh, but he only went into the yellow jersey on the penultimate day, of course. So UAE Team Emirates only had to defend yellow for a grand total of 122 kilometres. About 22 of them were spent sipping champagne. That Actually, is... I'm not sure they were allowed champagne, but it was quite relaxed, let's put it that way. That's how you got to win the Tour de France. Imagine <laughs> yeah. that. Couldn't be better. Anyway, this year, things could be very different. Firstly, Pogaccia could well go into yellow earlier in the race. And secondly, the other teams, you would imagine anyway, will be far more wary of shepherding them around France. Yeah. But will they have a choice? Well, I mean, yeah. well, let's say it's equally likely that Primoz Roglic, one of the other big favourites, could go into yellow quite early for Jumbo Visma. And if he does go into yellow, what choice does that team have? I mean, how differently can they ride to last year if they're trying to defend the lead of Primoz Roglic? Well, that is true, actually. I guess that's for them to decide and for us to find out. I mean, could Roglic follow Pogaccia, whereas last year maybe just let him go? Well... Oh, this is one of the stories that I can't wait to unfold during the race. It's going to be fantastic. Anyway, in terms of their respective teams, both are quite strong. But UAE is certainly stronger than last year, with the likes of McNulty, Mike Hood, and Formula to help Pogaccia in the high mountains. But then they don't have the experience of some of the other teams, so it is going to be a big test for those guys. It is, yeah. Jumbo Visma, meanwhile, are going into the race with one sole leader this year, as opposed to last year, where they had two. So Roglic is going to be supported by Turnison, Kreisweik, Vinegard, Hessink, Tony Martin, Cuss and Wout van Aert, a team for all terrain, it's got to be said, well, particularly with Wout van Aert there. Yeah, yeah Wout van Aert will uh, take over from any other rider on any terrain, yeah. won't he? And one that is more than capable, that team, of supporting Roglic's ambition of winning the Tour de France this year. We don't have a form guide because he hasn't raced since Liège Baston Liège, which is at the end of April. But I guess Roglic's form guide really is his own set of stage race results over the last three years. In that time, he's done 11 stage races. He has won seven of them, was second runner up at last year's tour, third at the 2019 Giro d'Italia, and then crashed out of the Dauphiné last year whilst he was in the leader's jersey, and then crashed out of the leader's jersey again in Paris Nice this year. He is unbelievable, really, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Ineos Grenadiers, they look to have the strongest team in terms of the general level. Uh, between them, they've got the experience of 46 Tours de France between their eight riders, which is equaled only by... Israel Startup Nation. No, oh. Alejandro Valverde. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now in all seriousness, I'm pretty sure that the Ineos lineup is the most experienced at the race, despite the fact that Theo Gegenhardt is making his Tour de France debut. Uh, he's one of three Grand Tour winners that they've got in their roster, Richard Carapaz and Geraint Thomas, plus Richie Porte, of course, has finished on the podium of this race just last year. Yeah, they've also got Roe, Castroviejo, Kwiatkowski and Dylan Van Barle completing that eight rider roster. Question is, will strength in numbers be enough to overhaul the raw strength of Pogaccio and Roglic? I don't think it will be. No, I don't think it will. I don't think so. Is it, is it ever? Has it ever worked, the three-pronged approach? It has, or at least having multiple Grand Tour winners has. Killian Kelly's got his stat attack uh, a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember it now, though. <laughs> <laughs> what they have said, though, in this Grenadiers is to expect the unexpected. So I'm now expecting the unexpected, which I guess makes the unexpected more expected than it was before. Mm. I think they're basically going to attack, though, wherever they possibly can, which is good for us. Isn't it, it would be fact? good. Would it be Movistar in the 2019 Giro that was won by Carapaz? He wasn't the team yeah, leader, was he? Yeah, he wasn't mentioned in Killian's stat attack, but that was right, yeah, because Lander was there, wasn't he? That's right. Well, with Carapaz, yeah. Anyway, maybe when they say expect the unexpected, Perhaps they just mean that Garrett Thomas is going to stay on his bike this time. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ow. No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Um, and it's, of course, not all about those three teams, is it? Although, looking online at the odds, you would think that it was. But Julien and Philippe of Tekernic Quick Step is the next biggest favourite. Came close to winning overall in 2019, didn't he? Um, and there are rumours that he is targeting the GC rather than just stages. Now, Dan, last world champ to win the Tour de France. Greg Le Mans. Yeah, 31 years ago, uh, which is a long time. Uh, not a few you, I suppose, uh, but uh, it is to me. Anyway, not as long ago as the last French winner. So uh, if Alain Philippe could cause an upset this year and take the win, I think that it'd be a popular one. Do you think it'd be an upset? I guess it would be. He's it not would, a big, wouldn't it? Big favourite, is he? No. I would love to see it though. I've got to say. Yeah, me too. Uh, beyond that, EF Education Nippo's Rigoberto Uran had his odds slashed after that ride at the Tour de Suisse, where he smashed everybody in this mountain time trial and finished second to Carapaz on the GC. Hard to imagine him winning it, no. isn't it? But again, I would like to see that. Do you want to guess who the next rider is in terms of favourites on the odds? Lopez. No. Nope. Mass. No. Nope. Uh, Kelderman? No. I don't know. Pick it up. Mark Padun. Really? It was Mark what? Padun who what? was the next favourite on the list. Did you not watch the Dauphiné? Well, yeah, but... Serious. Yeah, he's right up there. But he won't be any more because Bahrain Victorious have decided they're going to leave him out of their squad. Uh, so, they're now going to be led by Jack Hayde, who was fifth overall at the Dauphiné a few weeks ago. That's bonkers, isn't it? Um, because that really would have been a turn up for the books, wouldn't it? But uh, there you go, Mark Padun, Tour de France champion. Um, but yes, Haig and Bilbao should be as solid as ever for that team, you'd think, wouldn't he? Uh, and Cobrelli for everything else. Um, back to my guesses, though. Miguel Angel Lopez will lead the Movistar team, along with Enric Mas and Alejandro Valverde, there for stages, you'd think. Ooh, you could take yellow, couldn't he, on that first stage? He could do, yes. It'd be good, wouldn't it? Uh, strong group, it's got to be said. Uh, and with Lopez in particular, you might... Well, you never know what to expect. He has flashes of brilliance in the mountains, including that win on the Queen stage last year, of course. And he'll be liking the look of those high-altitude finishes this year. He will be, won't he? Well, who's the other rider you mentioned? Any guesses? Uh, there's quite a lot of them now. Kelderman? Yes, Wilco Kelderman. So he will lead Bora Hansgrohe's GC Challenge with Emmanuel Bookman, who crashed out of the Giro, and Patrick Conrad for support. Uh, Jakob Fulsang, the Dane, will lead Astana. Uh, last I heard, though, he was going more for stages because his focus is on the Olympics. And then Group Armour FTJ will be counting on David Godou as their leader. Right, we've got all this way, Dan. We haven't actually mentioned the most successful tour rider in the field, have we? Chris Froome. No, we haven't. For good reason, though, I'd say. Yes. I mean, both him and his team have said that he's there as a road captain as opposed to going for the GC, which doesn't seem like an option for him anyway, given no. what we've seen so far this season. But we should definitely mention Mike Woods, a solid, solid rider in all terrain, as long as it's not a time trial. Yes, that's right. Uh, proven weakness this season, isn't it, for, for Woodsy? Dan Martin is riding two, um, and they've only got two riders in their lineup under 32 years of age. They're very experienced. Is how very I, experienced. Is how I would put it, Si. Strange, then. We should also mention that documentary we've got coming out uh, should be out uh, this week, actually. Indeed, with Mike yeah. Woods behind the scenes with the team, our Flesh Wallon and Liège Baston Liège. It's a brilliant watch, and they gave us a lot of access behind the they scenes. They did. I it? saw a new side to Mike. Mike Woods, 
Did you? I did, yeah. Good time trials. <laughs> Not that side, unfortunately, no. Um, but no, fascinating, I thought. I absolutely loved it. So yeah, do check that one out. Uh, Naira Quintana will be racing and leading Arkea Samsic, uh, racing four, should I say. They had a horrific criterion of Dauphiné recently and publicly admitted that uh, after the race. But it would be good to see him back at his best for the Tour de France. Do you want to hear my outside bet for the race? Not really, but you're probably going to tell me anyway. I am going to tell you anyway. Okay. It is Ben O'Connor, the Australian, uh, now riding for Age 2 r He was fantastic at the Jura a few years ago, uh, and it's really come of age, I would yeah. say, over the last year or so. Those Jura stage wins, and then at the Dauphiné, he was very solid indeed. I reckon a chance of a top 10, if not better. Well, Dan, your predictions are normally uh, spot on, aren't they? Actually, no, to be fair, they have been getting better, haven't they? You had a, a good run of form this year yourself. I'm glad you backed it up because I sensed a hint of sarcasm in your voice <laughs> at the start of that. Uh, Team Bike Exchange are coming to the race with Esteban Chavez and Simon Yates, but they've said they're going for GC with Lucas Hamilton, whilst the other two are stage hunting. And that is a big opportunity for Hamilton there, isn't it? It is. Right then. Shall we move on to the sprinters? We probably should get on to the sprinters, otherwise the Tour de France will have started before this preview is <laughs> finished, won't it? OK, let's start with the big two, Caleb Ewan and Mark Cavendish. <laughs> yes, that's right. The Max Missile will be making his first appearance at the Tour de France since 2018. An opportunity that's arisen firstly because of an injury ruling Sam Bennett out, but secondly, you've got to say, just due to the fantastic and quite unexpected form that he's shown this season. Exactly, yes. And whilst I do really feel bad for Bennett not being able to race and therefore try to defend his green jersey, he is going to have more opportunities, isn't he? Cav is six years Bennett senior, and I think the entire cycling world is very intrigued to see whether Cavendish can add to the 30 Tour de France stage wins that he has amassed over the course of his career. Given what we've seen recently, that is by no means out of the question. Far from it, in fact, especially when you have Michael Morku as your lead out man. Caleb Ewan, meanwhile, has said that his ambition this year is to take a stage win in all three Grand Tours in the same year. And if he manages it, he'll be the first rider to do that since Alessandro Pataki achieved the same thing back in 20, 2003, shall I say. And only the fourth rider in history to have won a stage of all three Grand Tours in the same year, so that would be quite something. Yeah, the sprinter with the most wins of any this year, though, is Arnold de Mar with eight. Now, he was left off his squad last year, but won at pretty much every other race. And at this year's Tour, he is going to be there, and he'll have arguably the best lead out of any team and sprinter there. He's got Guarnieri, Scottson, Konovalovas and Stefan Kung. So some serious horsepower when it comes to the flat road. Now it's been a while since we've seen DeMar going head to head with the likes of Caleb Ewan at a Grand Tour. So that too is going to be a very interesting story to unfold during the race. Yeah, as is Tim Merlier, a name not many of us had ever heard a couple of years ago, at least outside of cyclocross anyway, uh, but now one of the best sprinters in the world. He had that stage win at the Giro, so he can do it on the biggest stage. And in fact, between him and Van der Poel, Alps and Fenix could mop up that first week of the tour, couldn't they? Yeah. Particularly as Van der Poel and Philipsen will be a formidable lead out formation on their own. They will be, yeah. Yeah, they could definitely mop up. And as a second division team, that would be really quite good to see, yeah, wouldn't it? Would. Uh, they'll have to beat the gorilla, though. Slight surprise inclusion, adding to the average age of the Israel startup <laughs> nation, is Andre Greipel. Uh, they decided to pick him after his recent return to winning ways. And I wouldn't completely count him out of a stage victory over the course of the three weeks because he's still got the raw power. He just needs a clean run to the line. He has, yeah. Right, others likely to be mixing up in the sprints are Nasser Buani, Brian Cockard, and Christophe Laporte, and Sonny Cobrelli too, as well. Uh, not an out-and-out -out sprinter, but as we've already said, certainly someone who could challenge for a number of different stages, and also the green jersey too. Which reminds me, we are yet to mention Peter Sagan. <laughs> no, slight omission, perhaps, yeah. I'll admit. Well, he is there too, Peter Sagan, going for stages and an eighth green jersey. Uh, weirdly, though, Peter Sagan is more recognisable outside of his trade team kit than he is in it, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, and so you'll be happy to hear that you'll be able to pick him out easily this year because last week he won his seventh national Slovakian title. That is a relief, actually, isn't it? And I really hope he's on form as well, because him versus Van Aert versus Van Der Poel in those uphill sprints would be quite something to watch, wouldn't it? It would be, as they battle it out for second behind Sonny Colbrelli. <laughs> uh, now, in terms of time trial specialists, look no further than the Swiss pairing of Stefan Kung and Stefan Bissiger, both of whom will be licking their lips at the prospects of those two pretty flat time trials. Uh, Kasper Asgreen, Wout Van Aert and Mikkel Björk will also be looking to excel on those stages. And I think... That just about covers it, doesn't it? Where to watch, 
what to watch, who to watch, and all that remains is to make our predictions, which are not quite as hotly anticipated as the race itself, well, but almost. I think you're doing us down there, Si. Yeah. People really look forward to this bit. Yes. Not. Anyway, I am going to go for Today Pogaccia. Really? Yeah. I think it's more of a heart pick again than head, but I just love watching him race. I love his attacking style and I love seeing him win. I don't really know why, and no, I'm not supposed to have favourites, but I think he's just a brilliant racer. Yeah, okay. I agree, actually, completely. And if it wasn't boring, I would say exactly the same thing. But I'm going to go for Carapaz. I think those high mountain stages, particularly in the final week in the Pyrenees, mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether the multi-pronged approach from Ineos Grenadiers will yield a sneaky little result for Carapaz. It's just brilliant that they're on the back foot of having to use that three-pronged attack and it go is on good, the isn't attack, it? isn't it? I think it's going to set up for a fantastic race. I was hoping you were going to say Guillaume Martin, just because we hadn't mentioned him in the previous bit, but there you go. <laughs> uh, right, let's see who everyone else is going for this year. I'm going to go for Tade Pogaccia. It's a one-horse race. What's the kilo are insane? My prediction for the 2021 Tour de France general classification is Garrett Thomas. Come on, G. Hi, everyone. My name is Sebastian Aedo from GCN in Espanol. I want to give my prediction for this Tour de France and it's Rigoberto Urán. Go, Rigo! I think the next Tour de France winner will be Tadej Pogacar. Again. My favorite for Tour de France uh, is uh, Tadej Pogacar. I think uh, he's going to win uh, again, yes. My prediction for the 2021 Tour de France is going to Tadej Pogacar. My prediction for the Tour de France is Richie Porte. I think the fact that Ineos don't have a specified leader and they have so many strong riders in their squad, I think they're just going to run rings around UAE and Pogacar. And I think Richie's going to benefit from less pressure and come to the fore. Look at those summit finishes too and the rolling TTs. I think they really suit him. So I think this year is Richie's year. Side note though, Mark Cavendish, definitely for a stage win. Okay. I'm not sure if anyone's still with us by this point, but if you are, thank you very much for watching. Hopefully that has got you in the mood, if you weren't already. Well, I'm definitely in the mood and I've got my watch sign. I don't think I'm going to sleep between now and Saturday. No, and no, I'm not going to be able to sleep until my TSO watch arrives, <laughs> which is hopefully soon. Well, with that, uh, we shall say goodbye. Thanks again for watching. See you soon.